we are ready to rock and roll. Let's get Charlotte on board. Yeah! Hey! How are you? All right, thanks. I'm just trying to prop my phone up. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, no, you're sounding good. Perfect. Right, how are you? Yeah, well, thanks. How are you? Good, yeah, I'm doing well. We had quite a long day of sessions, but it's been great. It's I been bet. really good. But you're bringing a slightly unique flavour to, to the uh, occasion. Oh, okay. The only sports performance conversation or personality that we're going to have. Okay. But before we get started, I thought I'd surprise you with a little something, just to set the mood of life. No. Like, Lighter tone. Yeah. All right. I've never done this, but Cara was going through the wardrobe the other day. She says, oh, can we yeah. throw this out? And I said, we can't throw it out. So I've never worn it. Do you remember this? We what never got to wear these. Hang oh, on is, it the, is it the bomber jacket? <laughs> <laughs> this is, tags and all, to show that I've, I've never worn it. So if anyone no. wants to buy it, real. This is the uh, opening ceremony jacket for... <laughs> The Rio Paralympic Games. It looks Look really that. good with the tag on. Looks really good. With the tag on. Yeah, like <laughs> authentic. And um, oh, I never. Yep, yeah, it, it's not. They're not actually real pockets. Oh. That's, wow, so, that's a throwback. Wow. I was going to tell you to wear yours, and then we could have been like matchy matchy. You know but, what? I, I don't even know where it is. That's that's bad, <laughs> isn't it? I've probably put it. I've got a box of all my stuff that I keep from. Um, but like, like games and stuff, and it's probably been boxed away for a bit of time. But I, I've definitely still got it, but it's not one I wear often, shall I say. This sentimental value attached, isn't it? You kind of don't want to throw it out, but you're yeah. never going to wear it. Yeah, exactly. It's I weird. can't possibly throw it out, but it will just be in a box for a few <laughs> years, probably. Right, so let's uh, let's dig into a bit of background. I've got a load of things I want to talk about. Give uh, okay. give us a little bit of an overview. You will do a better job of it than I will do because I'll just big you up for the next five minutes if I do your bio for you. Okay. Um, but Charlotte and I, I've got a little bit of scene setting, and then you can kind of fill in the gaps. So yep. Charlotte and I have known each other probably since about two thousand eight, two thousand nine. We started working together in the build-ups yep. in London. Um, Paralympic Games. Charlotte at that point was um, was a swimmer, and we can, we'll come on to that as why well. you're not a swimmer technically yes. anymore. No, um, no. So I was Charlotte's strength and conditioning coach, and then Jacko when he joined the team did some work with Charlotte as well through London, through Rio, um, and yeah, Charlotte to give it a little bit of context. Charlotte is one of the athletes that I have the utmost and highest levels of respect for because your career has not been a straight linear progression upwards it's yeah. fair to say yeah. um but i started told Karen that i was like we were going to chat tonight and um and she said the same thing she's like charlotte's just like one of the best examples that we know of resilience and yeah. it's like i don't know if you, you know if someone was going to describe your life whether you'd be like that's the word that people would want you would choose but it's actually like a really significant thing because it's it's been such a your ability to do that has been such a defining um, quality of your of your personality and your career, which has got you to where you are now, and now it's like, yeah, it's been really cool. So, give us a little bit of context about what your journey's been like. Um, so yeah, I mean, sort of just to go to you, would that be the word that I'd want people to use to describe me? You know, it, it, there could be worse words to be described by, and I think um, it's not until you take that time to step back and reflect on your career that actually it is quite a that's quite an apt word to use. Um, because like you say, things didn't always go to plan and didn't always go the way I wanted them to. But um, yeah, I was a swimmer for many, many years. It was a sport that I had done from being tiny. Um, and that was because really my disability, um, I'm a bilateral leg amputee, for those that don't know. Um, it, at the time, it was the early 90s. It was probably one of the only sports that was available to me at the time that, that um, allowed or had a, a bit of a pathway for disabled kids to, to go down. Um, so it was a hobby. And then when I moved to university, it became something a little bit more serious. Um, that's when I got on a program and funding and everything like that. Um, went to my first Paralympics in 2008. I was 21. So relatively old in terms of like debut Paralympic games. Um, like since then I was at every major championship for swimming until Rio 2016. Um, and then I had a bit of time out and now I'm, well, I've been involved in para canoe for three and three and a half years now. So um, that's the next part of the journey. Um, but yeah, I've been which is going well. 
Yeah, really well. Um, <laughs> yeah, three-time world champion since I moved over, which is not what I expected at all in the first few years. But um, yeah, it's it's an amazing challenge, and it's it's a it's a change that I didn't really know that I needed until I did it, and then I was like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be for the foreseeable future. Yeah. So let's talk about that because that's one thing I really wanted to sort of dive into a little bit. So there's obviously training as an elite athlete has been compromised by coronavirus first and foremost. Yeah. Um, so what you do on a day to day basis has shifted massively. Like a lot of people's like worlds would have been disrupted a little bit, but yeah. I think from an athlete's perspective, where most people can take their job and they can do it at home, or they might have been furloughed or whatever. Um, some people have lost their jobs, but yeah. you're almost not exempt from the pressures of a performance. Uh, yeah. No, your project is still going to have to, is, is your, 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 the work and your focus is still going to be delivered, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, so when, they, when coronavirus kicks off and then they put the Paralympic Games back a whole year, talk me through what happens when you find that out. Had you seen it coming? Mm -hmm. Had you mentally done some of the preparation before then? Or, or was it like still a shock? Um, it was a bit of both, to be honest, because it, when we went into lockdown, it was a very gradual thing, certainly for performance sport, because we had got a bit of an exemption from the government to carry on training as yeah. normal as we could. Um, but then when we realised it was becoming too risky for us and everyone else to, to do that, we gradually started to shut things down so that eventually we weren't allowed to, to go on the water or anything. Um, and at that point, it was when the athlete voice around the world was probably starting to say, you know, a decision needs to be made. Whatever that decision is, we can't just plough on knowing or hoping that the games will go ahead because it's putting people at undue risk. And, yeah. you know, we couldn't train properly. So it added that extra stress to then think, well, if I'm not training properly, how's that going to impact my performance? In it would have been sort of four or five months for the Olympic guys and only six for us. So mm -hmm. we wanted the decision. But then when it came, it didn't make it any easier to to deal with um even though we knew it was the right decision um and obviously like you know from a coaching perspective you write training programs that are planned around a particular point that you want to achieve something and so our whole four years has been sort of um structured around performing to our best this september so obviously to extend yeah. that by an extra 12 months is was a massive challenge for everyone they were sort of squirreling away trying to rewrite macros and everything like that um so it was a challenge but you know we're used to things not going the way that we want them to and it's just an added hurdle that we've got to get over to to get to the games next year now um yeah did you feel a sense of disappointment i'm sorry if you can't hear me it's just started a thunderstorm so is it, is yeah it's just right? finished here yeah yeah i can hear you fine uh, okay. yeah. i just went down from mansfield yeah. um <laughs> did you feel a sense of disappointment or or was it more like an opportunity or, or like because you're peaking right you're looking good right so you just come yeah. back from a, a really successful world of championships yeah that's really like exactly from a performance sport perspective what you want that springboard into the games yeah and all of a sudden like okay i've got to do that again now to then go yeah. springboard again how yeah. do you feel about that it was exactly that it was you know there was disappointment there was the the worry that we we sort of planned everything like you say to springboard to this summer and you know that there was always that sort of well what if next year doesn't go the way that this year has and um what if we don't get it right next year and I think that that was something that we always knew we were gonna have to contend with once they cancelled the games everybody's kind of going well what if I'm not fit next year what if you know you know anything can happen in 12 months 18 months so it's definitely something you have to deal with but um I tried to kind of flip it around as you know this year we'd got halfway through the season we hadn't quite got to the racing part of the season um but the training over the winter had gone really well so there's not a huge amount that we want to change next year which is i kind of have to look at it in the way of we've had a we've had a dry run and it was going really well yeah. so why wouldn't it go the same way next year if we do the same thing but just try and push it on and so then i started to be really excited about it because I've only been doing the sport for three and a half years. So, you know, mm. how much more can we push it on if I've got an extra year behind me and I've got an extra yeah. year of experience? And I think that's been the whole thing with this lockdown is trying to take the things that haven't gone quite so well or the things that we can't do and focus on something that we can improve because of the circumstance. And 
it might be something that we don't get chance to to work on on a daily basis when everything's normal because we're going full steam ahead with what we've planned but there might be other areas we've not explored that now we have the luxury to explore and and that's really exciting yeah and what's that look like for you what areas have you felt like you've had the opportunity to spend some time like focusing in on well it goes back to that stuff and i i post about it a lot and it goes back to the work that we did when we were working together and yes there's the traditional land-based work and the gym-based work and strength and all of that but in both the sports i've done it's really important for me to understand how the top half and the bottom half of my body are working together and so being able to go back to some of that calisthenics work to really strip it back to understanding how my shoulders and my hips and what leg I have all work in tandem to kind of create this this sort of system that it allows me to put down that strength so it's been really nice to go back to sort of basics in a way and, and movement skills and just that understanding has been great and because I've not been plowing down to the water all the time and I've not been able to go in the gym so it's been what can we do with the equipment I've got at home and is it just a case of getting the Swiss ball out and starting to do some movement and understanding that yeah, I'm going to move out of the conservatory. <laughs> yeah, I wondered what that was. Absolutely. Like, hey. <laughs> Linging it down. Hang on a minute, bear with me. I'll put a light on in here. Oh, it's fine. Yeah, so that's like a really interesting point because it's because um, we brought calisthenics into your kind of training program a little bit sort of when we were, I don't know, like a couple of years out of the Rio cycle. Mm. Just cause we often get quite a lot of questions from people who are in swimming particularly. Um, about what the potential benefits of training like that are. Like, what's been your experience of using like calisthenics um, um, for a sports performance output? I think for me, certainly when I was at swimming, it was because swimming's a, a bit of one of those funny sports where yes, you've got to do gym work, but you ask any swimming coach, and and the swimming is the priority, and it it's yeah. the lion's share of what you do in your week. Um, so for me, we kind of understood after a few years of working together that that right balance of gym and water work was perhaps not smashing the weights in the gym because it meant that I couldn't perform in the water but mm. we really like I said strip it back and understand those real you know specifically around my shoulder and all of the shoulder stability work and um when you stripped it back and we kind of looked at the body position of where I was in the water and understanding you know, the weight distribution between my top half and my bottom half because I'm top heavy because my legs don't weigh as much. So it was how we worked on that. And, uh, you know, we challenged that in different positions, didn't we? Like we worked through the yeah. the handstand work, which eventually we're doing on a BOSU, I think, in the end. And really challenging <laughs> yeah. that instability, but keeping that kind of base and that kind of core part of my body position strong. Um, and that... And I, I think it just helped that I was able to do a handstand already. So we could sort of explore a bit more and kind of try a few different things, yeah. which was, which was great. And I, I, it was really helpful and um, just broaden that understanding, which I think I got to that point in my career that I wanted to understand that what I was doing was, was going to transfer to the water. And, and, it, and that did. Yeah. Absolutely. And what was it like when you got to Parry Canoe and you've got now like, this calisthenic stuff that you really enjoy doing as part of your gym program was it, was it part of what they were doing already or did you bring it in and be like i've got this stuff that i think is pretty um, cool i don't know whether they did it already to be honest but certainly in para canoe it's much more winter training and summer training just because in the winter we can't be outside as much because of the weather so yeah. the the win the winter summer difference is much greater than when i was swimming um so mm. the winter period when we're really working on um strength and capacity and things like that is when we can explore a little bit more on land so we have sessions programmed into our week um which aren't gym and they're not water it's we call it robustness which is essentially injury prevention it's strengthening shoulder capacity yeah. it's working on rotation and things like that and that's where we kind of put in a bit of we do some um a bit of bars work and some boasty work we do a lot of balance work um and so that's where it kind of slots in really nicely in yeah. my winter blocks. 
Yeah, I think that's it. And that's, that's what's amazing, I think, is that as we continue to have conversations around sports performance and calisthenics, yeah. and particularly around stuff with children, like we've done some stuff with Scottish rugby and um, mm-hmm. we're doing some work with autistic the guys, um, the sprints and, and athletics uh, company in the States. It's, it is that exact piece of going, well, let's talk about um, the shoulder and where physio kind of lets off or finishes mm-hmm. and where strength and condition traditionally starts. Yeah. And there's a piece in the middle where we're missing. Like we, we can scale strength. Yeah. We probably have a hard time like scaling stability. So for people that are, are sort of like interested in, there's, there's so many people getting in touch and I've got issues with, with shoulders. Obviously, I've, I've, my, me and Jack have got our own history. Yeah. Tell us a bit about what your history of shoulders was like and how kind of, what they're like then how calisthenics changed it because there was some periods of time where your shoulder was on an I used to describe it as a knife edge yeah like, real borderline yeah yeah and I think you look at any swimmer's shoulders and they're probably 40 years older than the you know the <laughs> age of the swimmer and I think towards the end of my swimming career I was having real trouble with um impingement and just real grotty pain whenever I was trying to put any power through the stroke and like like you said, it was getting to the point where I was losing days and days in the water because I just couldn't yeah. plow through the pain and it wasn't worth it. And I had two MRIs on both. I had MRIs on both my shoulders in probably that last year. And I remember the the radiographer or radiologist kind of getting me into a room and he, he was like, "Well, there's nothing hugely wrong with your shoulders, of course." When I first looked at them, there was so much like scar tissue and. <laughs> <laughs> past injuries that he said if I didn't know that you're a swimmer I would have been really shocked by it but just the amount of stress that you put through your shoulders when you're a swimmer is enormous and it's relentless mm. repetitions of being overhead which is a you know it's a horrible place to put that force down and we're doing it for four hours a day some days and it's just disgusting on the shoulders but when we we were working together and we kind of started working on that engaging the scap properly and making sure that I wasn't kind of in those awful shoulder positions and working on posture and the real basic stuff you know your your rotations the the um internal external rotation work you know I think there was one exercise that we did wasn't it where it was just like an isometric hold against a wall to try and strengthen yeah, yeah. that just just hold it there and not allow my shoulder to kind of pop forward and let my pec do everything and that I didn't understand that until we started breaking it down and taking it back to that sort of you know understanding what Mm. the shoulder does and how important it is to everything else below it Um, and that was a real eye-opener for me and it changed kind of everything because we kind of got on top of it didn't we and we managed it which was what what we needed to do. Yeah, it's been an interesting thing because we, we Jack and I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and, and I had a, a bit of ten, some like information on my tendon yeah. um, in a in, in, uh, from the back end of last year into January, and I started to get some like I was struggling overhead a little bit, and yeah. what happened is I'd over I'd overloaded and underloaded it in previous to Christmas, so I went away for three weeks, didn't really do a lot on it, yeah. um, and then it just kind of it started to get a bit niggled. But the interesting thing about it was that I'd probably had warning signs of it for about six months before but it wasn't yeah. that bad that i didn't do anything about it I, yeah. it's kind of like i was, I was aware that it wasn't moving great but then like when i when i came back i kind of i tried to rehab it a little bit spent some time with a, with a, a session with a physio friend of mine and um Gemma jefferson you know Gemma. yeah yeah of yeah. course, of course. Um, so um so but then i did the same process as what you did and and, and when, we, when we were talking on a podcast with jack i just rattled through it. i was like oh yeah stripped it back found out where i was tight did a little bit of isolated activation and built the pattern back up and now it's fine yeah. and, and it's that it's understanding that process of the shoulder requires so much neuromuscular control and precision yeah. that you can't you can't fix very often i should probably say you can't fix a problem shoulder just by training global movement like you've got to go back and what i'd lost was was a lot of like just that fine motor control around the shoulder of external rotation and yeah. being able to pr- bring the joint head or the head of the humerus into the socket yeah. without like you said just crack into lats and pecs because like, oh, boom just gonna yeah. be strong <laughs> yeah but it's sure uh, i can remember you getting like properly frustrated with that work because you don't yeah. feel like you're doing anything but for whatever reason you can't do it and it's really annoying yeah it's so it's so true and it, and it is and i think because in my head i was I couldn't at the start of it get my head around like you say it didn't feel like I was doing anything and I thought well how is this helping I'm not I don't feel 
tired. I don't feel that gym kind of, oh, I'm so tired. I've worked really hard. I, I, don't, I didn't feel that. But like, like you rightly said, I was so frustrated. So I couldn't do what you were asking <laughs> me. And I was literally, it was move the TheraBand from here to here without doing, and I wow. just could not do it. And it, it was like, it's the most simple movement, but understanding where that you initiate that movement was so tricky to me. And it, 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 ha it does take a real patience and willingness to work through something that perhaps doesn't always feel um, easy or, you know, even though it's very basic, it, it's quite hard to plow through mm -hmm. that. But it, you know, obviously it is, it's hugely worth it. And the work that it's doing is massive without you really realizing it. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also fair to say that we were trying to do that work on a Friday morning after you've probably done about eight swim sessions that week. And yeah. Probably not yeah. always in the, in the, after the swim session, you're not always in the greatest frame of mind. So people are just tired no. now. You're not giving me stuff which is just pissing me off. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I've just swum for an hour and 45 minutes. And then I've got to quickly get changed and come straight in the gym. And I was just, yeah. It, I mean, you had a rough deal getting me straight after a Friday morning. Uh, session. <laughs> but um yeah i think the energy levels might have been a bit different on a on an afternoon at the start of the week <laughs> yeah i'm sure i just want to see that susie signed in so uh, oh, another swimming, uh friend. yeah so with all that sort of stuff shot like obviously um i remember one time we were shoulder where it was probably um one of the the, the more kind of nerve-wracking times for me and i don't know whether we ever really kind of verbalize it but you kind of picked up a niggle the christmas or the december before the games i think in um, which is going to be the following September. I can remember yeah. us being in like March time where we're like, mm, this is a little bit kind of borderline. But, yeah. and this is kind of what I wanted to get some of your takeaways on. Like you've been through a number of different processes through your career where, or time periods where you've kind of had to kind of properly do that process of regrouping. And yeah. I'd just be interested, I'm not going to, I don't want to lead you in any, any direction on that one, but like what have you learned from all of those times where you've been in a place where you're like, okay, things are pretty crap right now and I need to find my way out or I don't know where the way out is because you've always managed to kind of climb and pick your way through quite a bit of complex situations. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, again, I think it, it's a challenge of any athlete. If you're going to put your body through what you put your body through, you, could, you expect to have niggles and things that affect the, the daily routine, which then affects the mind because we love to know that that consistency is there. It's what gives us the confidence when we step out onto the field of play. If you And I remember working with Jacko when I was doing the psych stuff with him. And he, he used to say, you know, if you can step out to race, knowing that you've done everything you possibly can, you're in the best possible place to perform. And obviously training disruption for injury starts to get into your head of, well, I'm missing out on xyz so then when you come to race you think well have i done everything that i can because i've been so plagued by days where i've had to have old sessions or i've had to have a few days off for whatever reason and it's really tricky to navigate that um but i think i got better at it as i got older and i think i started to understand that it was part and parcel of what i did and I think that's when we kind of stripped everything back and we actually worked out what I needed to do versus what we thought I needed to do. And that in turn had a massive impact on those injuries and things like that were affecting me physically and mentally, stripping it back to, well, the textbook says that we should do X, Y, Z at this point of the season. But actually for you, it doesn't seem to be working. This is when we always get injured or this is when we pick up uh, a niggle that, you know, is there any need to do this? Is that affecting the body? And so when we started to play around with things, then that was when it gave me that ability to sustain a level of training that was enough. Um, yeah. And I think that that was part of the, having those honest conversations with everybody that was around me and making sure that, Everybody was on the same page, coach, S&C coach, psych, physio, me. We were all singing mm -hmm. from the same hymn sheet and that allowed me to, to navigate those slightly tough times with, well, actually, we just need to have faith in what we've planned and it will come good eventually. Yeah. Um, it's not easy at the time, but 
I think once you understand that everybody's fighting for the same cause, it makes it so much easier to, to work through those rubbish types. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an interesting one for people that are sort of listening to this and, and not in an elite sport environment and going, yeah. what does that look like for me? And it's just like the, when we when in an elite sport setting, we just layer more complexity onto it because it's basically yeah. more at stake effectively. Like we have to perform because for the athlete, for the for the team, for the country, whatever it might be that we're, yeah. we're, we're involved in that conversation. But I think for most people, like there's a couple of things you said there. If they're like training calisthenics or training sport or whatever it might be, that they're just enjoying it and they're a recreation athlete, yeah. there's those times of stripping back and working out what you actually need to do because mm -hmm. it's so easy to add more all the time. Yeah. But what actually we're going to be the most beneficial thing is like you said, get back to right. What do I what do I really need to do? Mm. But then also be very clear on what you want out of it. And I yeah. think you got to that point where you've actually started to refine those those processes. You had a very clear goal. You knew what time you had to swim. You knew yeah. what you what you needed to do. What was interesting thing for all of us is when we did less, you swam faster. Yeah. And I was like, this is not how it's supposed to work. No, I know. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing the thing, and yet she's getting quicker. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I think what, as I got older and I got through my career, and I, I mean, I think there was this five seasons, I think, that I never swam a personal best. And I was winning medals at majors, but I was never getting faster. And it was, it, that was a real grind. And I, how, mm. how I kept going through that, I have no idea. But I think <laughs> I always knew in the back of my mind that there was more to give. It was just finding the way to get it. Um, and that was when we stripped it back. And actually, I, I, before, I think I, it was five years of not PV'd. And then when we finally got the, the mixture right, I think I PV'd three times in three weeks or something ridiculous like that. It was like, a, it was a six week period that I kind of went from being just completely flatlined to going way quicker than ever gone before. And like I said, I was doing less and it was just mm -hmm. finding that right balance that worked for me. And I think that's really important, especially when you can kind of get caught up in what everyone else is doing and, it's just something that I apply now to canoeing and I, I've got that benefit of experience and I've got that benefit of knowing what potentially went wrong at swimming and now I'm eager to not make that mistake at canoeing and it's about training smart rather than lashing myself into the ground and not yeah. being able to get out of the hole that I've put myself in and that's hard to get your head around sometimes when it doesn't feel like you're doing a great deal but you have to have faith in that it's the it's the thing to do and um that's something that I'm so thankful that I went through that and had that period where we had to think slightly differently because it's been mm. a godsend for the rest of my career, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a, a really important takeaway for people to, to, to go through that process on a regular basis. Because yeah. we kind of get the fitness industry will pull us into the process of thinking you've got to be the hardest worker in the room. Like You've got to do more than everybody else and that's how you get better. Yeah. The physiology will tell us that actually like, and, and, and even as an athlete, because you... you you constantly got that pressure of so my competitors might be doing more than me. Yeah. But I think it's when you that maturity that you're talking about now is going, do you know what? I'm they might be doing more, but if I'm doing it smarter, yeah, like, I, I haven't got to do as much. And and that's okay. the whole thing. You need to do there's as little as possible to get the most amount of change. Yeah. And when you get that right, then you're gonna be in a good place. Absolutely. And it, it's not to say it's not difficult. You know, there's still days where I think Whoa, I wonder what such and such is doing and should I be doing that? But it's it's then having the ability to have those conversations with the people that are around you, whatever that may be, um, and whoever that may be, and, and float those ideas, you know, do I need to be doing this? And if not, why not? Um, yeah. I'm a big, I want to understand why I'm training. I don't want to do anything if I don't think it's going to better me, because mm. why would I do that? And um, so I think knowing that and having that freedom to talk to someone and have that conversation, do we need to do this? What about this? Can we try this? Um, yes, no, maybe, let's try it for now. Um, that's crucial to, to any sort of upward trajectory in my mind. Yeah. I always love that about working with you is that you'd always like, like I always wanted you to know why I chose <laughs> why? something. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, it was just such a good relationship because I would always like, from that perspective, when I come and say, this is what I'm thinking, I would always be quite open about that. Yeah. But then you, you did the same thing of coming back and going, like, you weren't afraid to go to me, why are we doing this? Or is this the right way to do it? Or the stuff we're doing in the water is not complementing what we're doing here. And I remember, I'll never forget one time when you said to me, and this was probably a game changing point for me, it was like, you know when I feel really good in the water at the beginning of the season? And I'm like, what do we do at the beginning of the season? We do loads of lightweights 
and loads of high reps before yeah. we get bogged down in heavy work. And then we went, right, let's just do loads of that. And it was that, that was a turning point. But it was that honest conversation around what, yeah. like, what does it look like? What do I need to do? What's going to work? Yeah. Um, so for my last, the question before we start to wrap it up a little bit was just around loads of people, because they love training and particularly because calisthenics is, is addictive, they want to do more yeah. of it, but it's quite high intensity. They find themselves picking up niggles. And like you've had issues with elbows before, with wrists before, with shoulders, like super common injuries in calisthenics. Mm -hmm. What is your advice to people who are thinking like they might have a bit of something going on, but they don't really want to kind of acknowledge it? And then also, what, what did you learn from like, you got quite good at getting over injuries. Like, mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit around identifying injuries and then also dealing with them. Um, so identifying them, I'm I'm the first person to you know if I and I've been injured since I've been at canoeing. Now it's not shoulders, it's it's ribs and back because of the rotational element. Um, but it's the same sort of thing. And I think the more you can know your body of what's normal for you is the first thing because I know that when I do a certain amount of certainly now in canoeing it's whenever we change our training block my back flares up I know that now and we can almost prepare for it before it happens but I wouldn't have known that had I not become very in tune with how my body responds to stuff so I think the biggest thing is to know your body of what's normal and what isn't um, and that can be really hard to to start with to, to know what what's normal and what isn't um and it's have that conversation with um i don't know if you've got a physio or you've got a sports massage person or whatever it is that kind of gets your body through the training that's the first port of call and chat it through and don't ignore it because i've i've done it and thought oh that's not felt quite right but i'll be okay and then i've carried on training on it and it only has made it worse and then the time recovery is five times as long or whatever but it um once you've got those that experience of knowing what's normal for you it makes it so much easier to identify things and and alter things before problems get too much of a problem if that makes sense um yeah. but but yeah it's tough it's really tough and it but i just kind of got to the point where i was like i'm putting my body through the ringer i'm it's not a machine like i it's gonna give at some point and it's how you can sort of reduce the give point as much as possible mm -hmm. um and know when to push and when to say actually this is enough for now like we need to just reset and re recover and go again um yeah but it's tough it's really tough it's that same thing is i think the point you make about knowing what your body's like in terms of knowing yeah. yourself and then also just listening because you get plenty yeah. of warning signs it's, it's rare that you oh. get a door where it just goes bang and you're all of yeah. a sudden okay so it's a traumatic injury maybe contact base is a bit different yeah. we're talking non-contact injuries yeah. you get signals for quite some time oh, but you're, absolutely. you're just not doing anything about it yeah and that's the thing i mean it's even it's not just to do with injury as well it's it, I, a big thing i've learned is fatigue levels and it, it case in point this week we were we work on three week cycles we have two heavy weeks and a, and a deload week and i was on a deload week last week and this week was supposed to be where it ramps up again and I didn't feel recovered enough after my deload week. I just, normally it sorts me out, but I got to Monday and I thought, I still feel tired. And I could have plowed through it the whole week as, as it was written. Um, but I had those conversations on Monday and we changed things up and we altered things for the rest of the week. And yesterday I had a gym session planned in and I started it and I, w I was 15 minutes in and I thought, I, I won't be able to finish this to the mm. standard that it needs to be finished. So what am I getting out of it? just plowing away at that fatigue level which then come you know monday morning it'll come back to bite me in the behind so yeah. what's the point in pushing through it so i after a few minutes of going oh i really should do this gym session but i don't think i'm getting anything out of it i actually listened to my body which was telling me i needed to rest and mm. it's tough but it's really hard when you want to do more and you feel like you should do more but listening to your body about not only injury but rest and recovery is so important it's, it's as yeah. important as the training great advice i think that's a, a good one to sort of for people to, to take away <laughs> take home yeah so what's training look like now so what's the reintegration from post the post corona lockdown sort of uh, starting to look like for you guys 
So we can go into our training environment uh, gradually. So tomorrow there's four of us, I think, that are allowed on the lake. Um, we're kind of the first people in. And it's all very regimented, temperature checks on before we travel to train in and everything because we're a centralised program in canoeing. So we all train in the same venue, which, you know, is a bit of a hotbed for a virus if someone was to bring yeah. it in. So we're being really stringent on access in and out of the water, um, boats being cleaned down uh, every time we've used them and gradually reintegrating back to training on the water. Gym probably will take a little longer because that's an environment yeah. that, you know, just sharing equipment is, is tricky. Um, but it's it, probably actually where coronavirus started, in a gym somewhere. It wasn't in the Wuhan food market. It exactly. Was like, it was probably in a gym. I know. Somewhere. Yeah. Um, so that's a bit challenging, but we've got what we, you know, we can at home to, to my, I've ruined one of my patio slabs by dropping a dumbbell on it in the first week of lockdown because <laughs> I'm gym training out in my garden. Um, but if we can get back out on the water, that's one step towards slight normality, um, which would be great because we've not been, I think it'd be 10 weeks that we've not been on the water. So that just to get the feel back will be, will be key. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't remember. I, I wanted to. The, the, the thought just came to my mind about the, um, the phrase that I'd, I'd heard that I realised I needed to, to remember it. But it was this idea that like you, you've got to keep training so that you're always ready because we still don't know what's going to happen, like how long this is going to take. Yeah. So rather than trying to get ready, just try and be ready all the yeah. time. I guess that's probably like the only mindset that you guys can adopt at the moment because we don't know what normal is going to look like. We don't no. even know what games might look like. Next well, exactly. Year. Yeah, and we've had our train. We've had our entire season cancelled. Basically, we're not going to get to race at all this year. So that's tough because we've done some really good work, and we're mm. not we're not going to even get to domestically race. I don't think just to to give ourselves a run out, um, which is tough. But um, you know, we, we've got a nice block running into the end of our season, which it would be coming into the end of our season now. Um, we're just going to get fit and we're changing the mindset of normally we're going fast, but let's work on that base engine, which, you know, I'm fortunate to have a pretty good engine from swimming anyway. So just need yeah. to get some more petrol going around it, which would be great. Um, <laughs> and it's a different, it's a different stimulus. It's a different challenge. But um, as far as we know, the games are going ahead almost exactly a year later. Mm -hmm. So we've just got to get through to October, which is the start of our season normally. And then, we know what that looks like from October onwards. We know what the year is going to be. We know when our trials are going to be. Um, we know when our peaks have got to be. So we've just got to get through to the start of a season that will look like something we've already seen before. Yeah. Yeah. Great. There's two comments coming through. One of them, somebody says that they, you look like a paintbrush. And I think they're probably assuming... I was like, how? Oh, and I thought maybe it's probably you. <laughs> look, Priya, I think it is. Lockdown haircut, it's like when you commit to a haircut like this and then you get locked inside for 12 weeks, like, you, 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 there's only one way it's going. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything else. No. Is that, break not on cut? That. is that not cut at all? From t is that no trim or anything? <laughs> uh, the, um, Cara did this back in the sides, we just left the top, which is now, <laughs> it worked all right for a while. Yeah. Johnny Bravo for a bit, but now it's um, <laughs> becoming problematic. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mark Shardlow's on. Thanks, Mark. Nice to hear from you. And then also, somebody called Ox Strong Health used to swim with you, Charlotte. Says you were absolute world class, and I would agree with that. Uh -huh. you know, okay, yeah, that's, that's Nathan. Yeah, he used to swim that's at Nova. Fine. Amazing. Yeah. Right, so that was everything. Thank you so much for that. I just wanted to. Um, uh, Owen's laughing at me now. I know. It's <laughs> People are like, why don't you shave it off? I'm like, I can't. I haven't got the right kind. Imagine me with bald head. It just wouldn't work, would it? I'm not, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen you with any other hair, but some form of that. I think. Well, what else can you do? <laughs> I think you just grow That's it out. That's our guy's hair. I don't know. Mohawk, yeah, definitely keep it like that. Just... Yeah. yeah. That's what guys do. You get a good haircut and you stick with it. Like, it's, you can't go messing about long, short. We don't have the flexibility that girls have with that hair. Okay. Gotta... Oh, yeah. And we're also terrified of changing barbers in case they don't get it right. Also true. Looks like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that sharing. Your, I think you've, like I say, there's so much experience of being in the game as a full-time athlete. For how long has your career been now, would you say, at a world-class level? 
Uh, so I raced my first international for GB when I was 17. Um, I'm 33 now, so 16 years. Yeah. Yeah, so you've done it. There's not much you've not done in that time. So, yeah. um, so I encourage everybody to, to take on board what Charlotte said. And I think even if you are not in a performance environment, just spend some time thinking about what it looks like for all of us and whether that's surrounding yourself with coaches that can help, get advice from people, training groups, whatever it might be, communities that you're part of. But um, yeah, take an honest look at your, at your training and uh, take some of the stuff on, on board because Charlotte learns it the hard way. So um, you have yeah. to um, <laughs> take the benefit from her advice. Yeah. But it's been so nice to catch up. It's been oh, ages yeah, since I've seen you. I, I always saw us and try and come and get, you get, get together for a coffee. But you know, the one thing that lockdown has done for me is it's put the brakes on. So I'm now going to create some more time in my diary to actually do the things that are going to yeah. be... More sort of well, I think been. it's done that for everyone, hasn't it? It's made you kind of reassess a few things and slow down and yeah. prioritise what's what's important. So if there's going to be a benefit that comes out of it, I hope it's that. And what's going to happen to, like, one thing we've not talked about, music industry or musicals. Oh! Like, like yeah. Charlotte is a very, uh, is a so, big stage theatre fan. I am. I, and, don't, I don't know. It's the same as, you know... It, a lot of the environments that are to do with theatre and things, it's it's very people in very close proximity. It's kind of similar to gyms and places mm. like that. It's it's not an easy environment to to start back up again. So um, I think it's going to be a bit of time before something like that comes up. But again, similar to the fitness kind of industry, there's been so much sharing of knowledge and experience online and. Um, a lot of performers I've seen have been doing stuff online, same as people doing workouts together online. So I think yeah. it's definitely created a bit of community. It's just not quite the same as being all together in the room. But um, yeah, I know I'm, I miss the theatre very much, but hopefully at some point I'll be able to get back. <laughs> It'd be a strange one, wouldn't it? It'd be like sport where you've got like every three seats is empty. It'd be the same oh, as theatre. It's going to be a strange yeah, I, world, I, did but, um, the clip, I did see the clip from New Zealand. I think they had a rugby match yesterday and it made me a bit emotional actually seeing like a proper stadium with a match and a crowd. It was like, it feels so long since I've seen that or experienced yeah. it. It's something that kind of gives me that buzz and, you know, to not be able to have that is, is massive. So hopefully at some point yes. in the near future, that'll be back. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I hope the next few weeks goes well, integrating back into Thank training you. and you get back on the water and uh, you enjoy wiping your boat down with uh, antiseptic wipes. Oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> that and me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you so much for joining right. us, Charlotte. It's been good to see you. We'll catch up Thanks, soon. Tim. See you later. All right, take Bye. care. See you later. Bye-bye.